Red, blue, rich, poor, country, city, left or right. Chances are you probably fall into one of those categories, and you may be quite happy where you are. The people of Better Angels believe there's still value in talking, and they've come up with a way of doing it that actually seems to bring people together. We'll listen to our Better Angels today on The Laura Flanders Show, the place where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the people who are doing it. Welcome. We are not enemies, but friends, Abraham Lincoln told a divided America in his first inaugural address, as much of the country prepared for civil war. We must not be enemies. Though passion may have strained, it must not break our bonds of affection, he said. Instead, we must call upon the better angels of our nature. Well, we know how that worked out. The bloodiest war in American history, 2% of the entire population dead, equivalent to some 6 million people today. Obviously, no one wants a repeat of that. But the country is pretty divided, and much of our money media seem to profit off opposing red and blue camps. So what else is out there? A group calling itself Better Angels is dedicated to creating working and listening space for people of ostensibly opposing views to depolarize, they say. Here to tell us about it, Better Angels co-founder David Blankenhorn and clinical psychologist Michelle Brody. She's one of the workshop moderators with the group. So, David, to you, as I said, it didn't work out well for Lincoln, so, so why go back into this frame of finding our better angels? Maybe we don't have any. Lincoln thought we did. He felt that there was something uh, in us that could be better the original draft of that speech, uh, written by someone else, had him calling upon the guardian angel of the nation, something up there to help us. Lincoln said, no, north and south, we have something that can um, bring us together as a nation. And it did not work then, but it's going to work now. So what the heck leads you to think it's going to work now? We're a resilient people. We basically care for one another. There's a lot of good things going on in local communities. There's a widespread heart sickness in the country about the direction of our politics. There's a widespread disgust with the way people on TV act toward one another politically. And so, I mean, I see it every day. And I do believe that um, we have it within us to um, go in a different direction. So what is Better Angels, your organization? We were an organization that was founded after the 2016 election to bring together people at the grassroots who don't agree with one another. And um, we don't try to make them agree, but we do try to encourage them to um, see some common values that they share as Americans, to look for some common ground, and to um, continue to work together afterwards in the local community. So we have about 7,000 members now, um, 32 local chapters, all 50 states, growing rapidly going to have a, our big convention next month in St. Louis. And so, um, and we'd like to change the country. We'd like to change the country. And, All right, uh, so let's play a clip of you in action. Here's an example of a workshop, I think, in Ohio. Uh, this part of Ohio um, is southwestern Ohio, and it's in between the uh, metro area of Cincinnati and Dayton. So there's a lot of rural and suburban areas, um, depending on what part of the county you're in. Factories have been closing down left and right, so I've seen a lot of forced um, retirements, a lot of forced layoffs. Um, once that some people get through the layoffs, uh, sometimes they are able to come back, some, a lot of times they weren't. I've had the door slammed in my face. I've had people say very rude things about Obama and ask if I voted for him. And some people would say, hey, you're not going to lie to me. Go ahead and put your sign in the yard. And other people would say, get out of here because you're a Democrat. I love Don Trump. A lot of people don't. And I think it's not his personality. He's a man that has given his life for his country, if you think about it. And that's why I love him. But the, the biggest challenge is getting that sort of a 
message across of who he really is. In my opinion, if you voted for Trump, then you're taking on all of the things that he and his supporters are for, um, and I think you're racist, and I don't want to be involved in that. Sometimes to speak to a, uh, an atheist or a, um, a person that's not conservative, have the same beliefs as me, uh, a person a, a person of a different color um, it's sometimes I want to talk to them but I'll tell you I'll be honest with you right now I'm I kind of feel afraid to, to, to open my mouth I am afraid that if this vitriol and and this animosity continues to grow it it, it might give certain groups a, a blanket check to to Touch of, to touch upon violence. There are nice people, people who do nice things, and I don't know how we get back to that. How does that video reflect the kind of work that you actually are doing on the ground? It gives us a sense of who's involved. Well, those people were participants. The, the, they were talking on that clip before they spent two days together and uh, they spoke very differently afterwards. A lot of those people are still working together locally right now. Uh, two of those people are on our Better Angels Board of Directors. And so, um, I, mean, I mean, Michelle can talk about this because she's actually doing the work with yeah. people now on the ground, but there is something very uh, dramatic that happens when people who think they don't like each other and think they have nothing to say to one another find out that they do. It kind of lights up a pleasure center in the brain, and you want more of it. All right, so Michelle, I was about to come to you uh, with respect to what you actually are doing in these workshops, and what have you seen play out? Sure. Well, people, we assume people come to these workshops with very strong beliefs, but they also come with, as the man in the clip said, a sense of wanting to talk about it. They want to be heard. People in the country want to be heard, and they want to be understood. And so, but they don't know how to bridge the divide. So the way the workshop helps them is to really set up structured exercises and with it, uh, to help them uh, express um, what they believe and be heard by the other side. But we do it in an unusual way, which is to say, first we set a lot of um, guidelines to say, we, we want to go with your better angel, which is the sense of, um, we understand you have your adversarial side and you have your human side, the side that wants to be heard. So when when a stereotype, for example, is said about you, how do you react to that? What's not true about that stereotype? Can you refute it? And then what has a little nugget of truth in that stereotype? And how is it that in your, the group that you belong to, whether you're in the blue group or in, your, in the red group, and we do some work with them separately first so they can kind of explore those uh, stereotypes with their compatriots. And then when they talk about what's the nugget of truth in it, they're looking a little bit at the weakness of their own side or the unfortunate things that appear in the media about their side. And then when they share it with the other group after, uh, you know, at a later point in the exercise, there's a sense of, wow, I'm listening to a real person who can look at it in a more nuanced way. And there's a sense of bonding and connection around, first of all, being heard and also knowing that uh, your side has value. Have you been surprised by people's appetite and, and interest in all of this? People come in wary, right? They, they like the idea of it, but they come in wary. And how do and you find them? So we do a lot of different uh, recruiting efforts. We have organizers in different locations who are interested in the Better Angels mission who do whatever they can, uh, online recruiting people in their churches and synagogues and their communities, and they try to just gather people who are interested in having a dialogue and being heard. Um, but when they come in, they're wary. Uh, people have come in saying, um, am I going to be yelled at here, or will I be treated with respect? And so it's really important as a moderator to set the guidelines to say, this is how we're going to speak to each other, and to do it in a structured way where people feel safe uh, and can get uh, something out of it. All right, so let's play a clip of one of these workshops in process. Take a look. Seven of us are conservative in our philosophy, typically voting for Republican over Democratic candidates and supportive of President Donald Trump and his administration, while eight of us are liberal in our philosophy, typically voting for Democratic over Republican candidates. The way this weekend affected me is I showed emotions I kept hidden for a long time. This is the first time I've cried and couple years actually. Um, so it brought some emotions out of me that 
I was afraid to show. I did end up liking them as people and even the one that came in and was saying he's arch conservative and, and Trump is his guy. We, we joked and it was a genuine laugh that, that we had with each other. And so I think talking really can, is not underrated. If more people will have this experience, I think maybe our country could come back together and pull together as one and learn to share and understand it's okay to have opposing ideas. It's okay to be different. We are still human, we still love one another. It smashes a lot of the stereotype of what one group or another group is supposed to be. And I have permission to call him my Muslim friend, okay? Because <laughs> we are our friends. So anyway, we have, we're gonna lay the groundwork, he and I, and we're gonna lay the groundwork, and one thing that we're gonna do, uh, representing what we just came from, uh, is he's going to attend a church with me, a Christian <clears throat> church, and I'm going to go visit. I'm going to go visit a mosque with him, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and we're going to see what each other are doing. Nice, nice. So, David, tell us more about those folks. What was it that brought the woman to tears, or what was the joke they shared, and what about those guys? Did they do what they promised? Julie is a member of a really uh, conservative uh, kind of patriot movement, and she, um, she uh, feels really strongly about things, and she uh, had the experience of talking about them in a way with people who disagreed with her that brought out a lot of emotion in her. Um, she's still active today in the local group there, and uh, Lebanon, Ohio. Um, the two uh, guys who said, I'll go to the mosque and you go to the church, they become friends. Uh, Kuyar and Greg are now the co-chairs of their local uh, Better Angels group. And they're actually both on now on our national board of directors. And you could not find two people who don't, uh, who disagree as much. And, um, and yet they've, they've become friends. And so uh, not just friends, They've actually working together on some local issues. Like because what? Because I was going to say, it's one thing to say that you feel in, you know, friendly, but would you actually show up for one another? They went to um, state legislators with other Better Angels members because there was an attempt to um, uh, eliminate gerrymandering from the state legislative districts. and. We have a rule that you have to get 75% support on both sides of the local group, and they got it. They lobbied and they got it. So they've been lobbying for gerrymandering reform as a bipartisan group in Ohio. And now they're sponsoring, they're supporting legislation that would reduce the influence of money um, in, in mm. state elections. So, so look, we, we are not just a group that has these workshops to help people feel better. We are a group that has workshops that help people feel better as a way to get them involved as civic leaders in their community, modeling a new kind of political effort. Is there anything else, you've mentioned gerrymandering, that brings the two together, Michelle, that you've experienced, that you've seen? In terms of outcome after uh, or no that Or issue on which people really do connect, even across difference? I think that where people connect is when they notice that they're actually polarized on values that are somewhat out of balance and so you what you find is one side is is very strongly advocating for one value and the other side is strongly advocating for the other so something like really on, like what like, like for example on on immigration um, you know one uh, the conservative side will say you know we need security we have to have we have to make sure that the country is secure the the uh, liberal side will say more we have to treat uh, people with humanity Okay, those don't have to be completely in mm -hmm. contention with each other, but they come up in the rhetoric in contention. But when you get people to talk about the underlying values themselves, like, does everyone want to treat people with humanity? Yes. Does everyone want the country to be secure? Yes. Ah, it's just about we're out of balance, and our rhetoric is blowing it up in a way that seems much more adversarial mm -hmm. than it actually is. So getting people there feels much more secure. Now, to be fair or to be real, we're about to head into an election season that is probably going to drive a stake through the red-blue divide all over again, aren't we? Is there anything that you've done, do you think, going to inoculate people from the appeals to sort of 
for lack of a better word, tribal loyalties that we saw last time around? Sure. Uh, yeah. It's happening all over the country. It's happening tonight in places that I don't know about. They're having these gatherings, and it does inoculate. Inoculate is a good word. Um, doesn't, it's, not, it's not magic, but what it does is help people rediscover one another as fellow citizens who they care about, and that's the secret of it all. And um, uh, we're not big enough now to, to change the country, but we plan to be. And uh, we, we don't have a big, uh, we're not lobbying Congress on things, but what we are doing at the local level is coming up with ideas. And they're, basically, we have groups of citizens who say, we've come up with ideas on a bipartisan basis. And we, so we're doing something that our elected officials can't or won't do. Um, look, we're in an embryonic phase. We've only been around less than two years. So we're 7,000 members, um, and so we're not going to shake our fist and change America. But we're growing fast enough, and there's enough hunger. For, see, we don't have to persuade people this is a good idea. People right. already believe this is very important. You get to, all they need is an opportunity. So I'm very optimistic that we can bring people together in increasing numbers around this, even during an election. They're going to be so, people are going to be so heart sick when they see all this stuff, and we're an alternative. Mm. Yeah. It has to be said, you, you have a, a good array in your video where we saw African American women, we saw white people, we saw women, men in equal numbers pretty much. Some of the critique I've seen is that it's very male, white, middle class heavy. Is that fair, not fair, Michelle? Uh, I think you, David, would speak to that more in terms of the demographics across. But the people who came to the to the workshops that I've run are across the spectrum, um, and um, I think we're making efforts to try to be sure we're inclusive of all different communities. The idea is to be able to speak across divides. Yeah. That includes across uh, racial uh, and socioeconomic divides as well. So um, it, it, that's the intention. Yeah, we we have a. Our policy is to try to reflect the country we seek to serve. That's our statement. We fail in certain ways. Um, we, the biggest failure we have is that we tend to skew toward the more educated mm -hmm. people. About a third of the people in the country have four-year college degrees. A lot higher proportion of our members have four-year college degrees. Um, a second way we fail is in our leadership. We tend to be more um, male in our leadership than, than, we, than we should be. So we're trying to fix those things. It is, I'm reminded as I listen to this of the sometimes frustrating disconnect between people like me, you, us, desire to let's talk this out, and other people who've often been the brunt of horrible policy saying, I don't want to do that work all over again. I just need your f boot off my neck. Uh, and that it's emotional work for me to explain how your misperceived misperceptions of people that look like me yeah. are wrong. Um, so how do you, do you deal with that? And if so, how do you deal with people feeling like they're just too tired to explain it all over again? Uh, you know, I think about that in the similarities it has to couples therapy, which is what I do in my day job. Oh, there you go. Um, you know, people are exhausted from fighting. They don't want to, they don't want to do the work of, of, you know, how do we settle this? Won't that take a long time? And I think the country, having gone through the last election, is the, the feeling of the exhaustion of what that felt like to people, I think it's still in memory. Yeah. And so at least people can agree, and this sometimes happens in my couples therapy, at least people can agree that they don't want that again. Right that they want something that feels a little more civil or that feels a little more reasonable or is more about the issues and less about um, the fight. It, when it feels like it's so win-lose, and of course we're up against that, right? The idea that it's gonna be win-lose. Is, is there a room to start a conversation about something that's more win-win again? I think there's an appetite for it, but oh, we need to I mean, done. look, people just have to suit up for this. Uh, uh, Speak for yourself. Wh Where's wh the suit? What's the alternative? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I walked into that. No, but think about, think about Laura. What's the alternative? Right. The alternative is we fight, fight, fight so that our team can win 50 plus 1 percent at the next election. Does anybody really believe they're going to get the country they want yeah. by having their team win 51 percent at the next election? Yeah. It's not that it won't make a difference, not that it won't be a great day for that side, not that it won't have policy changes that have enormous implications, but are we going to get the country we want 
by continuing in this way? The answer is no, we're not. So I don't, I don't, I don't, um, this is not a time to be tired. <laughs> <coughs> it reminds me also of the conversation that we recently had about democracy. Maybe democracy is not well suited for these kinds of differences because you may get your 51%, but there's still 49% there that are feeling pretty aggrieved. And in our, in our system, we can just ignore them for another four or six or eight years. The yeah. system was not designed that way. <clears throat> the system was designed to, uh, uh, to have uh, all kinds of uh, arrangements that uh, encourage deliberation and compromise. Those arrangements have been tossed out the window. Uh, and now we just have this law of the jungle that you're describing, but it need not be that way. It has not always been that way. And you're it's talking about the town meeting system <coughs> or even just congressional well, function. Well, to, to have uh, people in Congress actually talk to each other. There was a, a study recently that said 40 or 50 years ago, the typical member of Congress spent 60% or more of his or her time actually deliberating and making legislation, now it's down to about 5%. 95% of a congressperson's time now consists of fundraising and grandstanding on television about how great they are. They're 5% making legislation. And Alexis de Tocqueville, when he was traveling around the United States in the 19th century, he saw a great land of civic engagement, civic meetings, everyone's part of something, joining a group, participating in deliberations about everything from school board to local governance. Um, we've lost a lot of that. Is this perhaps surfacing a desire for people to get more involved? Is it parallel increased voting patterns or engagement of other kinds? Perhaps, and I think one other really important part of this is that we've sort of created slates of issues that have to go together. And on the workshops, what you notice is that people say, why do these issues have to go together? The one I'm really passionate about, I want to do something about. Uh, I don't really know why I have to, just because I'm Republican, also have to agree with the entire slate. It used to be, in our lifetimes, a little more of a loose connection to a slate of issues. And so that built into the system, I think, a, a sense that you could right. compromise on different things, as opposed to having to take the whole entire slate as one. And I think what, one of the things that we can do as Better Angels is be able to separate those a bit in the, in the debates and in the workshops as a way of of uh, creating more independent and nuanced thought. Have you found a, a, um, a method of holding these conversations that people could adopt even if perhaps they weren't members of Better Angels, but part of other groups that could do with this kind of exchange, this deliberative or deliberate process? Look, I think uh, I'd like to say, you know, you have bartenders and schoolyard attendants and couples therapists for a reason because these things are hard to mediate on your own, but if you set up the conditions in a way that um, says these are the set of rules we're going to agree to. No one's going to punch anyone. No one's going to punch anyone. We're going to call it out if we feel like something's getting too heated. We're going to take breaks. Um, and then you work inside of a certain set of structured activities. Um, you can get really great conversations that you couldn't have before. Um, but it takes skill and it takes a sense of purpose in keeping the, the, the conflict down. Mm. Yeah. And, uh, and there are lots of other groups that have sprung up in recent years that are doing similar things. Um, so uh, there's, no one, there's no one recipe that's perfect, but there's, a, um, there's just a tremendous hunger for this. Uh, even for people who don't think of themselves as workshoppy type people, there's a hunger there's a hunger to, 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 to be heard and to, to be heard and to find out what these crazy people who voted for this maniac or voted against, you know, whatever you think the is crazy, yeah. there's, a, there's a desire to actually, who are they? There's a real need for this. What's um, been your biggest <clears throat> surprise in this whole process, either about a thing or a person? My biggest surprise, Two, two very big surprises. One was that a lot of people on both sides feel that they, they work with facts and reason, but the other side doesn't. That is a very common belief, and that, that, did, that did surprise me. Another thing that um, <clears throat> surprised me a little bit was the degree to which the consistency with which people say um, afterwards, they say, you know, we're less divided than we've been told. And then if you ask them, who's been doing the telling, they say the media. Mm. So no offense, Laura, but um, you know. You're getting back at me. I'm going to get back <laughs> at you for that suit comment. Well, look, 
people, people uh, maybe unfairly, but they feel that um, going out in the country and talking to their fellow citizens is one thing, and seeing it how it's portrayed in the media is another, and the two do not have much in common. Biggest surprise? I would say that uh, we tend to think people are more polarized than they are. So when you show up to do a blue-red workshop and you're, you're expecting to see people who are super polarized and they come and they're less polarized than you think. In fact, on college campuses, one of the things you notice, and I thought we were talking earlier about also in, in high school settings, we might assume that our kids are already quite polarized, but they have a much less partisan points of view, and we could really capitalize on that. We could really try to encourage that nonpartisanship and anti-polarization in our younger folks because that's going to lead the way to, for people who are more jaded or who are more invested in their you know, win, winning side. Uh, I yeah. think we could learn a lot from them. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Michelle Brody, David Blankenhorn, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for Better Angels. People can find information about the organization and perhaps a group near them, you, at our website. Thanks for watching.